Hey guys, welcome to Capturing Christianity. I'm Cameron Bertuzzi, and today I'm joined by Dr. William Lane Craig and Dr. Ryan Mullins. We're talking about divine simplicity today. This is a Q&A on anything related to divine simplicity, but first what we're going to do at the beginning of this show is we're just going to talk about divine simplicity a little bit. Uh, well, we're going to define the term. We're going to talk about uh, what, are the, what the Bible has to say about divine simplicity. Uh, we'll cover the modal collapse objection of divine simplicity and then talk about another argument against divine simplicity uh, from agnosticism, which is pretty interesting. So we'll get to all of this in the course of the show and then get to some Q&A. So why don't we start off by defining the term. And what I like to do with my show is I like to dive right in to the, the material. So if you'd like to learn more about Dr. William Lane Craig or Dr. Ryan Mullins, check the description of this video. We've got links to all of their work there. Uh, you can also just search for them on YouTube, find tons of different awesome things about both of these guys, but it's great to have you both back on the show. This is not your first time here. So uh, thank you guys both for joining me. Sure. Yeah. Thank you for having me. Yeah. And uh, Ryan, we, we had some technical issues right before we started and uh, mm -hmm. I, we, we had to iron them out because your microphone, like if it's not working, what's the point of even doing an interview with you? I know, I know. There's just no point whatsoever of having me around <laughs> if you can't have these dulcet tones just like right in your ear. So exactly. Yeah. Oh, but before we start, Dr. Craig, if I sent you one of these hats, can you see this? Yeah. What does it say on it? It says Cologne. Oh, Cologne. Wow. If I sent you one of these, would you wear it? That would be great. Would you wear it? Yeah. You would? Okay. Yeah. All right. I may have to, I may have to send you one. Awesome. Okay. Uh, well let's, yeah. let's get into it. So where should we begin when we, when we're trying to define divine simplicity, who should start us off here? Why don't I'll pass it over to Ryan. We'll start with you. Okay. So as I see it, the doctrine of divine simplicity is a very strong doctrine. Uh, and I typically encounter people not accepting how strong it is. Uh, even people who want to defend the doctrine sometimes will just deny outright statements from classical theists saying this is what the doctrine says. So uh, let me kind of try to articulate a bit how radical this doctrine is. So the claim from Augustine is that whatever is intrinsic to God or whatever is in God is identical to God. Uh, and, and so you'll often see these kind of claims that like whatever you predicate of God is going to be identical to each other. So take, for example, God's greatness, God's goodness, and God's wisdom. So in the Trinity book six, Augustine says that all of those attributes are identical to each other and then identical to God's existence or God's being. Um, now, then also there's a further claim, which is uh, that all of God's actions are identical to each other, such that there's only one divine act. And this one divine act is identical to God's existence. So God's act to create the universe, God's act to send Jesus, those are identical to each other somehow, and then identical to God's uh, existence. Uh, and so this is what the majority of, of uh, people who affirm divine simplicity say. So people like Catherine Rogers, Thomas Aquinas, and Bonaventure make this kind of claim. But simplicity goes even further. So simplicity says that God does not have any properties at all. So James Dozel, Catherine Rogers, Jeff Brower, Mike Bergman, Augustine, Peter Lombard, and a lot of others explicitly say that the simple God does not have any properties, does not have any universals, does not have any forms, and does not have any tropes. So the medieval scholar, uh, Jeff Brower, and then other scholars like Christopher Hughes say that the simple God cannot have any exemplifiables of any sort. So the simple God can even have accidental properties like being the creator, the Lord, and judge of all men. Uh, that might sound a bit odd, because typically as Christians, we want to say that God is the creator and the Lord and, and judge of all men. But according to Augustine and Peter Lombard and uh, Aquinas and James Dozel and others, they want to say that those accidental properties are things that God does not have. And then John Duns Scotus says that accidental properties are repugnant to the simple God. So it's a very strong claim. Now, there's a further claim, though, which is that God, the simple God, does not have any potential whatsoever. Instead, God is pure actuality. Now, typically people want to associate this with Thomas Aquinas, um, but this claim is actually endorsed by a lot of earlier Eastern theologians like John Philoponus and John Asithopoulos, and then contemporary pro proponents of divine simplicity like Rogers and Dozel, who I've already mentioned, they think that you know this is exactly part of the traditional doctrine of divine simplicity. But then again, that's not all. Divine simplicity says that everything, so that since everything is, that is in God is identical to God, there are no distinctions to be made in God. And so according to the Eastern theologian, Maximus the Confessor, in God, this is a direct quote from Maximus, he says, there is only identity, simplicity, and sameness. 
And so this is why Dozel says there cannot even be logical, like distinct logical moments in the life of a simple God. And then when you look at Anselm, uh, Jacob Arminius and Catherine Rogers and a bunch of others, they'll say you cannot even make conceptual distinctions in the simple God. Because when you think about the identity claims, there is nothing in the simple God to ground your conceptual distinctions. Um, and you and you find this a lot in a lot of different thinkers will they'll, will they'll do this thing where they'll have some sort of theological puzzle that they'll solve by making all these distinctions in God. And then they'll take away those distinctions uh, later on by going, oh, well, yeah, those distinctions exist in my head only. They don't exist in reality. You see this in John Philoponus, Aquinas, Moses Amorant, and others. Um, uh, further, though, uh, what myself and then the medieval philosopher Robert Pasnov pointed out, that this denial of conceptual distinctions, it's actually a really key component of the classical understanding of God, and it's used to argue for divine timelessness, to move from simplicity to timelessness. So those are some of the really strong claims about uh, divine simplicity, and I think it's very important that we understand exactly how radical this doctrine is. So let's turn it over to Dr. Craig. And and what are your goals, Dr. Craig, in our emails was that you want to try to make this conversation today accessible. So how can we make accessible what Ryan just covered here? Well, let me just add one qualification to what Ryan has said. He's describing a very, very strong version of the doctrine of divine simplicity. And I think historically, there really is no such thing as the doctrine of divine simplicity. When you read the church fathers and other theologians, uh, you find a variety of views, and therefore it really is, I think, a misnomer to characterize this strong, strong doctrine of divine, divine simplicity as classical theism. Uh, I prefer to refer to it as Thomism, um, what the followers of Thomas Aquinas advocate. But when you read the early church fathers like Irenaeus and Hilary, when they said that God is simple, they meant that God isn't composed of physical parts that might fall apart so that God would uh, corrupt. They were opposing pagan polytheists and Stoics who thought of God as a physical entity. And so they wanted to emphasize against these uh, pagan thinkers that God uh, isn't composed of physical parts and he's not subject to uh, corruption. The first historical proponent I can find of this stronger view of simplicity is not even a Christian. He is the Arian heretic Eunomius, who in the name of divine simplicity denied the Trinity and said that God has only one property, namely being, uh, that God is pure being, very similar to Thomas Aquinas's doctrine. And he was vehemently opposed by the Cappadocian church fathers like Basil and Gregory of Nyssa, who wrote enormously long treatises, several of them against Eunomius, and they repudiated his doctrine of divine simplicity as he understood it. So I don't think we should let people get away with saying that this strong doctrine that Ryan has described represents classical theism. It, it represents some theists um, and comes most fully to expression in the work of Thomas Aquinas, but I count myself a classical theist even though I don't hold to this strong doctrine of divine simplicity. I agree that God's not made of parts that might fall apart. I don't think God is corruptible. I don't think that God has even metaphysically separable parts. But that doesn't commit me to theses like God has no potentiality, that God has no properties, that... Um, God's essence is existence, and so forth. Those strong affirmations go way, way beyond what I think most of us would want to affirm about divine simplicity. Ryan, why don't you just uh, respond to that and then also take us into divine simplicity in the Bible? Oh, sure, yeah. So I've got a few thoughts. Uh, one is, when you, I'm curious like how early it goes back, because it, because like I, I give a bunch of quotes from like Augustine and Maximus, uh, so it goes back some somewhat. 
Uh, now, Eunomius, um, so the patristic scholar Francis Young says that Eunomius actually had the exact same doctrine of God as the Cappadocians. Um, the Cappadocians were just playing with, basically playing a language game to try to get out, uh, to, to respond to mm. his uh, arguments. And I actually think that's right. Uh, I really do think that they were just kind of engaged in a bit of tomfoolery uh, instead of making really interesting metaphysical claims. Um, but this is a personal opinion of mine. Uh, um, so, yeah, so I, I do think, I guess, was, there'd be a lot more people on board with this doctrine. Um, but I do, I do think you're right, though, when, I look, when you look at people like Origen or Irenaeus and some of these, it's not entirely clear what they're up to. Um, yeah, so I think that's fair. I think that's fair. Um, but yeah, so scripture, though. Um, so this, the stronger doctrine of divine simplicity is the one that, that's, that's the one everybody's really interested in these days. No one cares about um, just going, oh, well, God doesn't have some parts. They, they want, this, they want, the, they want the, the bigger go home, right? So do you think that there is any biblical evidence for this? Like, I'll give my answer in a second, but Bill, you can go ahead and give your answer. There's absolutely no biblical grounds for this stronger doctrine of divine simplicity. In fact, I'm convinced that the strong doctrine is not simply unbiblical. I think it's positively anti-biblical. I think that the Bible tells us quite a number of God's essential properties so that we do have a good idea of what some of God's essential properties are, his goodness, his holiness, his being all-powerful, his being all-knowing, uh, his being all-present, uh, his being eternal. All of these are essential properties of God that the Scripture teaches us, because God himself has revealed himself to us in Scripture. So uh, I think that this doctrine is is positively anti-biblical. The idea that God has no potentiality seems to me to be obviously false, scripturally speaking, because God has the ability, the potential to do all sorts of things that he isn't actually doing. Um, so clearly God has tremendous, unlimited potential. I think I want to push back and disagree. So one of my yeah, favorite really? Bible passages, yeah, yeah, yeah. So one of my favorite Bible passages is Hezekiah 3.16. Uh, so Hezekiah 3.16 says, Thus saith the Lord, all of my attributes are one. Yea, and behold, I am pure actuality. Amen. So, oh, I think oh, 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 oh. <laughs> so, so um, no, but like... Like joking aside, they're like, yeah, I, I think I think you're right. Like, there's no biblical basis, and I do want to say it also is an anti-biblical doctrine. Uh, so I'll give you a, a, an example of this. So when we look at Exodus uh, chapter three, where God reveals His name to Moses, Moses says, you know, tell me who sent me, who's going to send me. Like, you know, go on, because uh, I'm not going to go to these Israelites and like just just come empty-handed. Who sent me? And God says, you know, I am who I am, or I will be who I will be. But then He goes on and twice says, you want to know who sent me? I am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Tell them that is my name. That is my name forever. He says that twice. Now, remember earlier when I, when I quoted uh, John Don Scota saying that accidental properties are repugnant to the simple God. Hmm. This is a case of, of the, uh, Exodus where God's revealing himself as saying, these accidental properties, I take them to be very glorious, in fact. I take them to be a part of my narrative identity or who I think I like my sense of self of who I am, that these are going to be my name forever. So what divine simplicity seems to say is repugnant. Scripture seems to say, well, actually, that's who God wants to reveal himself as and says that's part of who his sense of self. So I, I, th I do think that you have this very serious conflict between simplicity and what Scripture says. Yeah, that's a really, really interesting point that I've never heard anyone make before. For our listeners who aren't familiar with the talk of accidental properties, mm -hmm. um, the idea here is that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob are not necessary beings. They don't have to exist. They're historically contingent, and yet God says, this is the God that I am. I am their God, the God of these, these patriarchs. And he thus ascribes to himself this contingent property that, that he has of being the God of these contingent historical persons. That's really, I, I think, a remarkable insight, Ryan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is an argument there's I've been much, teasing around with for a while. There's too much agreement here. Let's turn to uh, modal collapse. <laughs> well, the modal collapse objection to divine simplicity, let's... 
the name alone is enough to like make people a little bit afraid. But what is this objection? Yeah. And then let's let's talk a little about that. And then if we have time, we'll get to the agnosticism objection. Right. Okay. So let me say what a modal collapse is. So modality is about um, concepts like potential and actual, uh, necessary and contingent. Uh, so those are different categories. When you have a modal collapse, it's when all of those get collapsed into a single category. So everything becomes necessary or everything becomes contingent. Uh, and so what I've done in my own published work is I've articulated uh, several different ways you could develop a modal collapse where uh, when you look at certain claims that uh, Christians want to make about God's freedom, God's power, God's knowledge, uh, and then you throw simplicity into the mix, then you get a modal collapse where everything becomes necessary. And that's bad because then nobody has freedom, not even God. So here's one way to do this. Uh, so I start with some really classical claims. So a standard classical claim is about God's f uh, power, freedom, and creation. Uh, so God's omnipotence is said to be infallible, which what that means is that whatever God intends to bring about must come about. So if God performs an intentional action to bring about this particular universe, then this particular universe cannot fail to obtain. Like it has to come about. So if God intends to bring about universe A instead of universe B, then universe A has to come about. Uh, you're not going to, the omnipotent God is not going to like somehow accidentally bodge things up and, you know, be like, oh, I wanted to bring about A, but universe B came about instead. Like that's not a possibility. Now there's a problem lurking here in the, in the, in the, in the woods though, that Aquinas and Scotus were very aware of uh, related to the infallibility of omnipotence. And so it goes like this. If God's intentional act of creating the universe is absolutely necessary, then the universe exists of absolute necessity. And so that's a modal collapse and Aquinas and Scotus, they don't want that at all because that would remove contingency and freedom for the world. So what thinkers like Aquinas and Scotus do is they say that God's intentional act of creating the universe is contingent. And so the existence of the universe is what they'll say is hypothetically or conditionally necessary uh, instead of being absolutely necessary. And so the existence of the universe is just kind of like necessarily follows from some prior contingent conditions, which are God's free act. So those are the claims about power and freedom, but here's, the, here's what I wanna say. All of that is gonna conflict with divine simplicity, and here's how. So recall the standard claims I made about divine simplicity earlier, that all of God's acts are identical to each other and identical to God's existence. So any intentional action that God in fact performs is going to be identical to God's existence. Uh, and so that's what proponents of divine simplicity explicitly tell us. So according to classical thinkers like Bonaventure and Aquinas, uh, and then the contemporary classical theist, Catherine Rogers, uh, the following divine actions are identical to each other and identical to God's existence. So God's act to create the universe, uh, God's act of predestination, God's act of salvation, all of God's providential actions, all of his salvific actions, all of those things are identical to each other and identical to God's existence. So what follows from that? Like what follows from these different identity claims? Anything identical to God's existence must share the same modal status as God's existence. I mean, that's just an entailment from identity. Well, God's existence is absolutely necessary. So if God's act of creation, predestination, and so on are identical to God's existence, then they must also be absolutely necessary. And then this lands us into a very serious problem. So remember, the classical theist wanted to avoid saying that God's act of creation is absolutely necessary. So according to Aquinas and Scotus, if God's act of creation is absolutely necessary, then the existence of the universe is absolutely necessary. And if God's act of predestination is absolutely necessary, then everything that happens in this timeline is absolutely necessary. Well, simplicity entails that God's act of creation and predestination and all of that are absolutely necessary since they are identical to God's absolutely necessary existence. So we get the exact modal collapse that Aquinas and Scotus wanted to avoid. Uh, and so we got this modal collapse. There's no contingency in the world. There's no freedom in the world for God or for creatures. And that's, that's, that's a very serious problem. So Dr. Craig, would you like to uh, say anything about the way that he's laid out this, uh, this objection? It, I mean, also it's, it's probably important to talk about the fact that you guys have both been accused of not addressing how Aquinas responded to the modal collapse arguments. So I, I know you kind of addressed that in what you just said, Ryan, but is there anything you'd like to add? Um, yeah, I guess I found it really odd when I started getting accused of this because my modal collapse arguments, like in, for my instance, like uh, my book, The End of the Timeless God, 
were based upon um, like just the starting assumptions that like already built in Aquinas' modality and his response into my starting assumptions and went from there. And then I actually have a whole paragraph going, Thomas will say the X, Y, and Z. That doesn't work for these reasons. So I was like, that's, that's weird. So um, I don't know. It might just be a case where either people just don't understand Mullins uh, or just aren't reading Mullins. I've seen both of those. Um, so I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> so Dr. Craig, let's turn it over to you. Well, I think there are a number of ways to result in modal collapse from the doctrine of divine simplicity. Here's just a couple of very simple ways uh, to understand it. Uh, everything that God knows, he knows essentially, according to the doctrine of simplicity. His knowledge is identical to himself, so he has no contingent knowledge. What that means is, since everything that God knows is true, that the same propositions are true in every possible world. In other words, there is only one possible world. So modal collapse results from God's knowledge being essential to him, or the absence of potentiality in God. Since God is pure actuality with no potential, he has no potential to do anything else than what he is doing. Therefore, there is no other possible world in which God does anything different, because if there were, then God has the potential to do it. So the absence of potentiality also leads to this sort of modal collapse. And what this results in is a sort of logical fatalism where everything that is or happens is and happens necessarily, which is absurd. Okay, so I think we've actually got a little bit of time. Why don't we turn to the mm -hmm. agnosticism objection? And again, we're going to get to some Q&A. So if you've got an objection to something that was said here, or if you've got some questions, then uh, we're about to turn to those quickly. So in about five minutes, turn it back over to you, Ryan. What is this ag agnosticism yeah. objection? And yeah. Yeah, so I've got a quote from um, Augustus Strong, who's this uh, Baptist theologian from the early 1900s. And so, um, and, and Craig, Billy, like you, you go to a Baptist church, right? Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So yeah. So I want to give a, a Baptist quote and then get a Baptist response to uh, this to see what, how, how, what you think of it. <laughs> so, so, um, so here's what Augustus Strong says. So he says, and I can't do the Baptist preaching voice. So, so forgive me for that. Um, so he says the nominalistic notion that God is a being of absolute simplicity, and that in His nature there is no internal distinction of qualities or powers, tends directly to pantheism denies all reality of the divine perfections, or if these in any sense still exist, precludes all knowledge of them on the part of finite beings. To say that knowledge and power, eternity and holiness are identical with the essence of God and with each other is to deny that we know God at all. So uh, Bill, just, uh, just kind of what you think about, do you think that's right or? You know, I, don't know. I think the conclusion is right, though I think the formulation is not quite so good. One of the aspects of the Thomistic doctrine of divine simplicity that Ryan didn't mention is the claim that God's essence just is his existence, that God's essence is the very act of being. But the act of being, since it has no properties, is not something that is conceivable. It cannot be grasped by the human intellect. So if God has no essential properties, as Ryan explained, if his essence just is the pure act of being, which is inconceivable, then it means, as Strong says, we literally have no knowledge of God. We have no idea what we're talking about. This leads to a concept of God, I think, that is more akin to the absolute of Hinduism or certain forms of Buddhism, which is beyond all conception, beyond all distinctions, and can be grasped only in mystical experience. And Nothing that, of course, add. I say, is, is positively anti-biblical, because the teaching of the Bible is that God has revealed to us a good deal of information of what he's like and what his, some of his essential properties are. Ryan, did you have thoughts on that? Um, I always stayed away from this argument uh, in my own work because I, I wanted to be a little bit more charitable. But I always, deep down, like thought, like this is this is this is right. Um, so usually, what I did was I would attack ineffable mystery and say, "Well, look, we, according to to Paul uh, in, in the Book of Acts, we do not worship the unknown God like the pagans do. Um, you know, because we worship 
the God who's made himself known through Christ. Uh, and then from there, just kind of like attack everything else they want to say. Because usually what a lot of the classical Christian tradition does is they assume, well, God revealed himself and God's simple. And so I'm like, okay, let's look at the internal conflicts there. Um, but yeah, I, I, I have always had the sneaking suspicion that something like this is right because a lot of arguments for God being uh, ineffably mysterious or unknowable are based on divine simplicity. Okay, I think with that, we're actually ready to turn to some audience questions. What do you guys think? Sure, great. Okay, perfect. All right, let's turn over. I've already got some of these queued up, so we'll start with Trevor Adams. Some of these are not strictly on topic, but they're still related. So Trevor Adams says, please help me understand the distinction between God's person and his nature. Is his nature what he is made of? If so, should we worship his nature? Bill, do you want to take that or you want me to? All right. Um, the, the nature of God would be his essential properties. Um, God is an omniscient, omnipotent, holy, eternal, omnipresent, personal uh, being. Th those would be certain properties that would make up his nature. Now, his person, as Trinitarians, we believe actually that God is tripersonal, that there are three persons who share that common nature, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So I think we worship the persons. Uh, we don't worship the, the nature, this set of, of properties. Do you think it would be fair to say we worship them, worship the persons because of the kind of things that they are? Yes. Yeah. So uh, I guess... Because like I've never understood the different objections where like, oh, well, you're just worshiping the nature. And I'm like, well, I worship God because he's perfect, uh, yeah. because he has a perfect nature. But I'm not worshiping, well, we, the, I'm worshiping the whole package. Like, I, Yeah, you're not worshiping you know. omnipotence, for example, or I'm, I'm going to worship omnipresence. <laughs> you worship God, yeah. not his properties. Now, of course, you see, for the simplicity theorist, he collapses the distinction between God and his properties says that either God is his properties or that God doesn't have any properties. And so this distinction would evaporate. All right. Here's a question from the champ. Any thoughts on Avicenna's defense of divine simplicity? I've worked on that a little bit because I wanted to trace the history of the evolution of this doctrine. And I have a real interest in medieval Muslim philosophy. And what you discover is that the roots of the doctrine of divine simplicity do not lie in the Bible. They lie in Plotinus, who was a Neoplatonic uh, Alexandrian philosopher who then exerted enormous influence on the history of Western uh, philosophy, probably only after Aristotle and Plato uh, would... Um, uh, Plotinus come in, in terms of his influence. And when the writings of Aristotle were lost in the Western world, they were preserved in the Arabic Muslim world. But they thought that the works of Plotinus were written by Aristotle. Uh, they didn't make a differentiation. And so in medieval Arabic philosophy, you have this strange amalgam of Aristotle with Plotinian Neoplatonism. And what was characteristic of this doctrine was a very strong commitment to divine simplicity um, that God, uh, as Ryan has already explained. And Aquinas read and profited from his reading of Avicenna, and Avicenna exerted a great influence on him. He, he even quotes him by name. Um, and so the roots of this go back through uh, medieval Islamic philosophy. And I'm proud to say that the great champion of the Kalam cosmological argument, Al-Ghazali, was adamantly opposed to this doctrine and to Avicenna's um, in uh, formulation and defense of the doctrine of divine simplicity. Ryan, would you like to, to say anything on that one? 
Uh, I mean, the only thing to add is what inspired my very first paper against divine simplicity to kind of develop like the first version of my modal collapse argument where I focus on God being pure actuality and finding all this unactualized potential in God. It was Al-Ghazali that, that, in, that inspired that, just seeing him go, mm. you got you guys have this awful like necessitarian view of the world. That's awful. That's horrible. And also like, it's just against the Quran. And so he's running all these arguments and I'm like, that, that just sounds so plausible. Uh, okay. I think I could do the same thing. Let's see if I can try to develop this a bit more. Um, so yeah, so Al Ghazali had a big influence on, uh, on my rejection of divine simplicity. Hmm. Okay. Let's move on to a question from Aaron Davis. What do you both make of Coakley's argument against Gregory of Nyssa's being a social Trinitarian? Also, any thoughts on Schleiermacher's doctrine of God? I can't answer that one. Uh, Brian, do you have anything? Um, I, I, I've hung out with Sarah before because we uh, uh, I worked at Cambridge for a year. Um, so her take on Nyssa, I'm tr it's been a long time since I've thought about this. Uh, I, I guess I go back and forth about whether or not I think Nyssa and some of the other Cappadocians are social Trinitarian. Um, William Hasker's book on the, the metaphysics of the tripersonal God has a really interesting argument for not just simply Gregory of Nyssa, but also um, uh, Augustine uh, being, at least he calls them pro-social. So they're not social Trinitarians because, I mean, these labels don't really get up and running until much, much later, much more recent times. Um, so I think it would be anachronistic to say like, yeah, they're definitely social Trinitarians, but they do seem to say things that are, I guess, pro-social. Uh, but something that, that, that Sarah can at least... Um, really bash a social Trinitarian on is, is she's looking at some of the earlier social Trinitarians who are really saying things like, um, God is a society, God is a family. Uh, there's just these three persons in a, in a, in an eternal dance. And, and she just has no patience for that. And I don't have patience for that either. So I think some of her critiques are fair. All right, let's move on to another question. Uh, this one's from Trinity radio. Uh, he's also known as Braxton Hunter. He was actually at our CCV one, conference over the past weekend and he was uh he was one of our speakers his question is will dr craig wear the kalam hat for at least a few seconds the next time he's on capturing christianity well now that assumes that uh cameron is going to invite me to be back on the show and i can't guarantee <laughs> that uh, but if he will i will definitely sport the hat D it depends on your behavior this time i suppose <laughs> but it's it's been pretty good so far so it, you you may get another invite back, maybe. Okay, here's a here's a question from pseudo pseudo Nim. Very clever name. Isn't the elephant in the room is the mystery of the Trinity? How's well it, maybe English isn't their first language. How's possible to have this mystery, assuming it's biblical, explaining they're not part of God? So it's going to require mm. some interpretation here. Yeah. So so, so Craig, since you've got this. Um... What, what it's, it's this Trinitarian monotheism where you do have some kind of compositional sort of take, right? Um, it's been a while since I've looked at your Trinity. Maybe you should try because because I would just deny that the persons are parts. Um, yeah, I just, I just I, like, I why would I do that? That's perfectly, perfectly legitimate. Um, what I think is the important point to make here, uh, and this is really, really striking, is that it has been in the name of divine simplicity that Arians like Eunomius, Muslims like Ibn Sina, and Jews like Maimonides all rejected the doctrine of the Trinity. The doctrine of simplicity has been a weapon in the hands of anti-Trinitarians against uh, Orthodox Trinitarian theology, because if God is tripersonal, then nothing could be more obvious than the fact that he's not simple that he, he is a complex being uh so what if nicholas Cuso walked in the room and he's like he's like dr craig i i disagree um because god is simple we know that the trinity like the difference between like muslims who deny the trinity and christians who affirm the trinity just completely disappears uh and so what would you respond to to nicholas Cuso? i don't understand how you can have three persons in one being without there being some element of complexity in it. They don't need to be thought of as parts, as you said, but there clearly has to be differentiation. And Thomas's doctrine of the Trinity to try to reconcile it with divine simplicity is just a hopeless muddle, I think. 
he fails to get really robust persons in his view of the Trinity, and his positing real relations within God is explicitly contradictory to his doctrine of simplicity, which would say there are no real relations in God. So even given Thomistic metaphysics and Thomistic presuppositions, I don't think anybody's been able to reconcile Thomas's doctrine of divine simplicity with his own doctrine of the Trinity, much less a more robust doctrine. Okay, let's move on to a question from Barry Anderberg. And this one is uh, is great. It's a great question. Isn't modal collapse entailed by any necessarily existing foundation of reality? How does contingency uh, derive from necessity? Uh, I just want to say no, um, because God has necessary features. God also has contingent features. Uh, if God has free will, he necessarily has free will, um, but that's a power that he could exercise in lots of different contingent ways. Uh, so uh, Keith Ward has um, a book on the Trinity that has lots of interesting, lots of very controversial things to say, um, but he's got some really good stuff to say on this issue of going, look, uh, God necessarily has freedom. Um, and part of what freedom is, is just a potential to do X or not X or a whole infinite number of things. So just the simple fact that God necessarily exists and necessarily has free will wouldn't entail that there's no contingency in God. Uh, and then uh, one, one further thing I guess I want to say. So I, I mentioned Catherine Rogers earlier. I find her work really interesting because she's very, tries very hard to be very consistent with a lot of these classical doctrines and a lot of these medieval doctrines. So she wants to say that God has free will and she accepts the modal collapse. But in one of her papers, she actually seems to like have this moment where she kind of takes it back and she goes, I think we do need to introduce an element of contingency in God in order to explain God's freedom. Um, but then in later paper, she takes it all back again and goes, no, okay, yeah, let's just go with the, the modal collapse. Um, so I, I think a lot of people re realize we do have to have some kind of contingency in God. Dr. Craig, do you have any thoughts on this? I, I'm, I'm also- No, I would agree completely with that. And I think God's libertarian free will gives him the ability to create contingent realities that do not flow necessarily from his nature. Yeah, I, I, I just don't see the conflict, yeah, when, when you accept that there's some contingencies in God, or if you leave, at least leave that open, right? So, okay, let's move on. Let's get to as many questions as we can. So here's a question from philosopher Chad McIntosh. He sent this in. Thanks for your uh, mm. substantial super chat, Chad. He says, uh, he's got an argument here. All concrete things have explanations. God's explanation can't be outside himself, but in himself. But there is nothing in a simple being. So if simple, God has no explanation. So if PSR, not simplicity. Is this a good argument? What do you guys think? Uh, I've chatted with, with Chad about this a lot, and I think it's a really fascinating argument. Um, so just to, to clarify, so the PSR meaning the principle sufficient reason. Um, so Chad already knows my take on this. So Bill, like, like what's, what's your take on this argument? Well, I, I'd like to hear yours. I guess I would be very skeptical of the first premise that all concrete things have explanations. That seems to me to be um, gratuitously assumed. So I don't think, think that, that God needs to have an explanation of his existence. Oh, that's okay. So that's interesting. So uh, Chad has this paper in, I think it's religious studies, uh, where he's trying to trace down the, like, the history of aseity and, um, and the PSR, so the principle of sufficient reason. And a common theme is that like, all things have an explanation, including God. Um, and so, this is, so, so he's looking at what a lot of different uh, historical figures actually said the PSR claimed, uh, which is that all concrete things do have an explanation. God's supposed to be self-explanatory. Um, you are yeah, not self-explanatory, so yeah. To, I probably need to adjust that because... If with Leibniz, you allow God to exist by a necessity of his own nature, then that can be the explanation for God, and, and that's fine. Uh, in that case, God can be uh, self-explanatory in that he exists by a necessity of his own nature. Right. So this is where the rub is supposed to be if you affirm simplicity. So you've got something you can, you, you can say. So with Leibniz, you're like, right, well, he's got the necessity of his nature. There's this thing, this nature. Uh, 
God's got it. Um, well, so you can point something in God. Well, if you've got simplicity, I can't point to anything mm -hmm. in God because there's nothing in God because uh, it's just all these, again, with the, from Maximus, there's just only sameness, identity, and simplicity. Um, so there's nothing in God that I could do to do the explaining. That's, that's, that's the, like uh, Chad, like mm -hmm. a bigger argument. Yeah. So maybe what they would do is kind of what Craig was originally doing is he just was uh, a bit skeptical about that stronger version of the, of the principle of sufficient reason. So that could be one way to respond. Yeah. So, um, so I guess, uh, so for, for Chad's, uh, argument, uh, what, what's really interesting about his paper in religious studies is he's like, here's the principle of sufficient reason that people like Augustine and Psalm and Aquinas affirmed, which is this really strong one. Uh, and mm -hmm. so it's like, okay, well, if you really want to be committed to like, like the, you know, the, the, the views of Augustine, like the A-team, you know, Augustine and Psalm and Aquinas, if I want to be committed to the A-team, um, I got this doctrine <laughs> and I've got this, uh, PSR, something's got to give, um, so yeah, it's, it's, yeah, that's that's why I think it's a really interesting argument. That's interesting. Okay. Uh, let's get to another question from Josh sketch show. Dr. Craig, I've been wondering for a while now and haven't gotten concrete explanations from anywhere. What makes a prophecy in scripture, a prophecy? What makes something just a metaphor or a statement? God bless you. Oh, um, I take it that in prophecy, God gives the human spokesperson the words that God wants him to say so that the person is literally uttering the word of the Lord. Um, now, that could involve metaphorical speech or other types of speech, poetic speech. So I, I don't think that there's any problem in saying that God could command a prophet to speak in a metaphorical uh, way. Yeah, Brian, if you have any thoughts on that, feel free to share. Um, Otherwise, we'll just... Yeah, I think that's right, because when I, so I've been looking a lot at Hosea for my stuff on impassibility, uh, and it's highly metaphorical. I mean, like the prophet's life just is a metaphor for the inner life of God and God's relationship with Israel. Uh, and then, of course, it was supposed to point towards like certain little realities, but, uh, but yeah, so like there's, I think a great biblical case of prophecy, just employing metaphors. Okay. Here's a often, question from often, uh, prophecies oh, in the old Testament involved visual metaphors too, didn't they? Where God would tell the prophet to do something like lie on his side or break a vessel or something. And these were sort of visual metaphors for the people to express God's message to them all right from cranman photo cinema is our videographer he says dr craig what does god is being itself mean <laughs> i think that it's unintelligible I, and i think thomas <laughs> themselves admit that we really don't have any understanding of this because the act of being doesn't have essential properties that you can grasp. It is an act. It's the act of existence whereby, in essence, is instantiated. And so it's it's unintelligible. It's inconceivable. We we have no concept of the uh, of the act of being. Ryan, what, what what how would you describe this this phrase? Um, I mean, I. I... Well, no one I really do, understands do Aquinas, so I mean, but I mean, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> but no, I do, I do find it unintelligible. But I usually just kind of grant it because everyone's like, right, it's inevitably mysterious, uh, and so now let's go from there and do all of our Christian theology. And so I'm like, okay, I'm going to grant you a mill and other uh, mystery. So I guess I'll, I'll grant you this one too, um, and we'll just go from mm. there. Uh, yeah, so I, I don't understand it, but I do appreciate a lot of people who uh, affirm this and admit that. So Catherine Rogers in, in one of her papers, she goes, yeah, it sounds really odd to say that that God is an act. Typically, a, a, an act is something a person does, not something a person is. And so she's just like, yeah, it's really counterintuitive. Uh, and then Eleanor Stump, her um, Aquinas lectures, uh, I think they're published as the God of the Philosophers and the God of the Bible. Uh, she really had, like wrestles with this for a while, just go, yeah, it's really difficult to understand. And it does seem like it makes God completely abstract. And then she tries to give some kind of interpretation to make sense of it that I... I just couldn't follow. Um, but yeah, I, I do appreciate that people who affirm the view go, yeah, it's weird, super weird. 
Okay, let's move on. Maverick Christian says, how exactly are you defining part such that a component of the Trinity isn't a part? Hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, so I, when I've asked different people who specialize in uh, what's called uh, myriology, so uh, parts and holes, um, most of the contemporary literature is looking at physical stuff. They're not interested in non-material things. Uh, and so I just kind of find myself lost really quickly when I'm supposed to take all this uh, philosophical reflection on physical parts and holes and then start looking at non-physical stuff. Um, so as I see it, I typically want to say a part is uh, something that could come apart. So if a thing is composed, it has things that are actually detachable. But um, given certain claims within the doctrine of the Trinity, such as the doctrine of perichoresis, or this claim that the persons are essentially and eternally uh, related to each other, they could not come apart. And so on those grounds, I want to follow someone like Keith Yandel and say, well, they don't count as parts. They can't come apart. Uh, and parts are supposed to be detachable. But to be honest, though, I've, I, just, I just find uh, parts and holes very mysterious. I find physical objects as a whole just very mysterious. Mm. In my model of the Trinity, I suggested that the persons of the Trinity are in some sense parts of God in that each person is not the whole of the Godhead. That if you take the Son, there's also the Father and the Spirit. And so in some sense, the person is not equal to the whole Trinity. He would be in some sense a part. But I've, I've had some second thoughts about that in that I'm not so sure we should identify the Trinity as the substance that God is. Rather, the Trinity is, in a sense, a group concept. It's a group. And in that case, the uh, persons are not parts of the Trinity. They're members of the Trinity. Um, the Trinity would be like, say, the rotary and then people would be members of the Rotary Club, but they're not parts of the Rotary Club. So if we don't equate the Trinity with the substance that God is, then I think we could avoid having to say that the persons are parts of God, even though they are members of the Trinity. Okay, so we're, we've are we got about 10 minutes left, and what I'm going to do at this point, I've got to be a little bit selective in the remaining questions that we can cover. So we did just get a question from Christopher Tomaszewski. Did I say that right? Tomaszewski? He's even been on the channel. I'm just so I'm Tom, super Tomaszewski. terrible with names. Tomaszewski, there you go. I'm just, I'm awful with names. Uh, so he, he just sent in a, a substantial super chat, and it's a good question. So we'll pull it up on the screen here. It's a little bit too big for this uh this display here. Let me just shrink it down and then read it. What explains the contingencies in God? What, for example, explains the intention in God to create this universe? If that explanation is from a necessary part of God, then modal collapse? Question mark. If no explanation, then brute facts? Question mark. What do you guys think about this objection? Uh, so the explanation would be whatever God's reasons are. Um, so you would have to ask, though, are the reasons compelling reasons like that, that, that would fully like where God has no other choice. Uh, well, most Christians want to say no, because then you get into a modal collapse. Um, so most people want to say there is some kind of uh, bruteness there. Uh, but that, Are you going to just like, have like a partial see, explanation? You would have a partial explanation, but you wouldn't have what you might call like a complete explanation. Um, right. And so sometimes people will go, well, that's fine, because explanations uh, don't always have to be contrastive. Um, what explains the fact that you did X instead of Y, mm, but you had good reasons to do X. That's all. Uh, so you, you have to get into some of that, to some of the, some of those debates on those issues. Uh, I don't know how to summarize those quite quickly though. Um, so I guess I'm, I'm happy to say like, maybe it's, it's not a contrastive explanation. you got to, God would have his reasons, but then that's that. Yeah. I'm inclined to say that this is just the nature of libertarian freedom, that a libertarian agent has the ability to make these kind of choices without there being ultimately any explanation for co any complete explanation for why he did one uh, rather than the other. That's just what libertarian free will is. Okay, let's move on to a question from writer John Buck. Uh, 
if God has potential, and it looks like this is an argument for divine simplicity, if God has potential, then God lacks something that he could gain. God cannot give himself that which he lacks. So, three, if God has potential, then God would depend on something else to change. Any thoughts on this argument? Mm -hmm. um, I want to say, even on the classical understanding where God is pure actuality, I, I don't think you really can say that like uh, the God like completely like lacks like like anything because uh, here's certain here's the thing that God would lack the value of a creator creature relationship. God can't have that by himself. Uh, so I so yeah so I so I just want to just kind of reject a, a lot of different things going on here by just saying even on the classical understanding of God I just don't think it really makes any sense um, to to really talk about God lacking absolutely nothing. I can say this I can say God lacks no perfections. Um, but when we're talking about the value of a creator-creature relationship, well, that's not like a perfection because uh, perfections are things that are uh, better to have than not have um, and that you can have to some kind of maximal degree. And so that God would have essentially. Uh, so God has all the, the great making properties. So he doesn't lack anything in those regards. But other things, sure. Yeah, there would be some kind of lack there. Um, but that's not a strike against perfection because he would have all the great making properties. I don't see any problem at all in saying that God has the potential to create things that he hasn't chosen to create. Uh, he could have created another planet in the solar system. He could have refrained from creating Cameron Bertuzzi. Uh, of course, God has the potential to do all of these different things, and he doesn't get that from anybody else. He is a libertarian free agent. And so he himself can make these sorts of choices and actualize his potential uh, in different ways. I, I just don't see that there's a difficulty here. Okay, uh, let's move on to a question from Scrooge Jones. Would it not be more simple of God to only consist of one person rather than three as described mm -hmm. in the Trinity? That is exactly yeah. what Eunomius and Ibn Sina and Maimonides maintained that uh, in the name of divine simplicity, we should be Unitarians. So doesn't Rob Coons have an article where he argues that divine simplicity is the only way to make sense of the Trinity? I know that there's an article, something <laughs> along those lines floating around. And Rob Coons, he, I love him. So Yeah, he's a great guy. I want to give him yeah, his, uh, his, his props here. Yeah, so Rob and I did uh, a dialogue about that paper on uh, the majesty of reason. Um, so one of the things I pushed him on was on his model of the Trinity, what distinguishes the, the persons uh, are properties. Uh, and I was like, well, but divine simplicity says no properties. And you've got a model where they have properties. And yeah. he's like, oh, well, I don't want to affirm that doctrine of divine simplicity. And I was like, oh, well, but that's like Augustine's view. Um, so... Uh, yeah, so um, so he's got a kind of simplicity, I guess, um, but he's got a God with properties. So it's not the the really strong doctrine that everybody's really interested in. Okay. As far as I can tell. Interesting. But yeah, okay. you'd have to go watch that video. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I'll uh, I'll just point people to that channel because it's uh it's my friend hosts it. So yeah, go check out Majesty of Reason with Joe Schmidt. Okay, uh, this may be our last question. We'll see how quickly quickly we can get through it. Um, so he, he, Josh sent in another question about the prophecies. He says, going back to my past question with prophecies, when it came to looking at the life of Christ and interpreting past prophets, were the messianic prophecies considered prophecies at the time they were written? I'm sure many of them were not. I mean, that's a question for an Old Testament scholar, not for a pair of philosophers. But my impression is that uh, New Testament authors read many of these Old Testament passages in creative new ways and would see Christ in uh, prophecies that at the time were not taken to be prophetic of the Messiah. Fair enough. Okay, so let's get to, uh, we, we, we do have a, a couple more uh, minutes here. So let's see, I'm, I'm looking for one that's related to the topic, Brute Facts Podcast. He says both simplicity, uh, for both, Simplicity doesn't seem very intuitive. Can you expound on the role of intuition in philosophy and its limits? Hmm. Okay, so I actually just finished writing a paper with um, a PhD student who's working on the cognitive science of religion on uh, intuitions. Uh, and so here's one of the claims from cognitive science is that belief in God is a very natural thing. 
uh, human persons naturally develop beliefs at very early ages. Uh, so what a lot of cognitive scientists of religion are doing though is going, well, but what kind of beliefs? What are the ones that are natural? What are the ones that are actually really intuitive? And so what um, we do in the paper is we uh, like line up a bunch of the things that, that all the, the cognitive scientists say are natural, things like believing that God's uh, in space and time, um, believing that God uh, has like free will and believing like, you know, like just lining up all these things and then going, none of that looks like simplicity whatsoever. Um, like that's very counterintuitive. It goes against all of our natural intuitions. Uh, and then we want to go like a little step further and follow the lead of um, our friend uh, Aku Vasala, who has another paper where he goes, so uh, there's this problem where he calls, um, uh, we are natural born idolaters. So if God really is timeless, simple, impassable, all these sort of things, um, all of our intuitions that human persons have just fly in the face of all of that. Uh, and so the problem is that, well, God's created, a, if God is impassable, timeless, simple, and all these things, then God has created a universe in which human persons naturally develop idolatrous beliefs. And that seems like a very silly world for God to create if he really wants to enter into friendship with us. Um, so yeah, I think that's one way I would say uh, intuition would play a role in uh, some of our theological and philosophical thinking. Dr. Craig, do you have any thoughts? No, nothing more to contribute to that. Okay. Uh, so I think we've got time for one last question, and this may be a short one. So... Josue Guedes, do you think that Thomist version of divine simplicity is heavily reliant upon continental philosophical grounds as opposed to analytic grounds? Well, I don't think so at all. It seems to me that this springs right out of medieval philosophy and that contemporary analytic uh, philosophers have in some measure really gravitated toward it. I, I don't see this being defended so much in Europe, except by Thomists, but um, in the analytic Anglo-American realm, it seems to me that quite a few analytic philosophical theologians are interested in simplicity. What would you say, Ryan? You you live and work in Europe. Uh, yeah, so a lot of the continental philosophical theologians I know tend to be um, quite conservative and want to just go, whatever the medieval said, fine. Uh, on certain issues. So that's been my impression. And then when you look at the analytics, um, yeah, like it's all over the place. Like some of us want to reject it. Some of us want to affirm it. But I can say this though, um, there is one sense in which Thomism does derive from the con uh, continental philosophy. And it's because Aquinas lived on the continent. So in that sense alone, I guess it'd be continental <laughs> philosophy. <laughs> Dr. Craig, do you have time for one apologetics related question? All right. Okay. So from... I'm not even going to try to pronounce this one, Alex. I'll just call him Alex. Uh, this stumped me. If man inevitably sins, then why is he then punished for this? Is it possible for a man to not sin throughout his life? Could God have created such men? God bless you, Dr. Craig. Uh, well, I don't think that Adam's sin was inevitable by any means. Um, that doesn't mean that he had the ability to resist sin in his own natural capacity, but typically theologians have thought that um, with the grace of God and the power of God, that he could resist sin. So he is culpable. It's not inevitable. How about you, Ryan? Any thoughts on that? No, not at all. I, I'll, I'll just I leave that to, <laughs> to every other people. Yeah, you're you're not the uh, the resident apologist here that's debated atheists all over the world, are you? Right. That's no, the, no. The other guy over. <laughs> yeah. Well. Uh, okay. I think that's going to do it for us today. Do, do you have any closing thoughts on the the dialogue today? Obviously, this is we couldn't cover everything. We couldn't talk about everything. But uh, in any case, I think it was. I hope at least it was interesting and uh, people got something out of it. Any any closing thoughts from from either of you? I have one closing thought. It seems like this debate over divine simplicity is just endless, um, that every article calls forth a response. And I think when I look at the pattern of the discussion, in my impression, it, I have the impression that the defenders of divine simplicity are being driven to more and more desperate extremes in order to defend their doctrine, so that it becomes increasingly difficult to maintain, increasingly implausible. Would you say that, uh, going going back to something that you said on Alex's show, Cosmic Skeptic, about the, 
the costs? Oh. Would you say that the costs are continuing to yeah, go up? Yeah, exactly. The that the price intellectual tag? price tag for maintaining divine simplicity is getting higher and higher as the discussion goes on. All right, Ryan, what that's, about you? Any, any last thoughts? That's been my experience, yeah. Um, so actually, to, to really back this up, um, one of the things that Joe Schmidt and I have decided to do uh, for any future work we would do on divine simplicity is just to continue and see how many implausible things can we push people to say uh, just to defend this doctrine, um, which I think is a very interesting project. But at some point, I do want to just kind of stop and go, are we even talking about things that could be true or false anymore? Because like some of these things, some of these claims about like extrinsic action, for instance, I find to be not only implausible, but just not even action anymore. I don't even know what they mean. And if we have to go that far to try to defend something that has zero biblical basis, I start to wonder, what is the value of this? Are we even really doing Christian theology anymore? Or are we just kind of, I don't know, doing the sort of thing that, that scholastics got uh, like accused of, of just arguing about how many angels could dance on the head of a, like a pen. So I, at some point I do want to go like, go like, yeah, let's see how many implausible things we can get people to say, but why are we, why are we even entertaining some of these wildly implausible claims for something that has zero biblical basis? Ryan, as I had your uh, your screen full screen just now, I was thinking, are you <clears> recording <throat> from IKEA? Is that an IKEA kitchen in the background? And no, I, I, this is the university owned um, apartment in a, in Finland, and so it is primary <laughs> IKEA furniture. And this <laughs> uh, lime green couch that it gave me is uh, it's a thing of beauty. Uh, and at some point, I'll show <laughs> you the very Finnish uh, artwork that they gave me, which is very pessimistic and. Yeah, it's very, very nihilistic. So yeah, so I feel very Nordic right now um, in this background. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Well, uh, thank you guys both for joining me. And yeah, I'm sure that this dialogue, it's already producing some responses from people. So yeah, the, but let's try to use this as a, a, w a way to continue the conversation. But uh, thank you both for joining me and we will see you in the next Capturing Christianity video. See you guys later. My pleasure.